like David said, we start with a blank, just a regular blank like you have. We round off the top. The top is going to be the tip of the feathers right here that's rounded off. Then we're going to put an interlock in, or a, an interlock cut in right here. It's going to be a C cut. This is going to be like an interlock cut. And the way that we do that is a couple of ways. Now in our book, we basically talked about using a pelican knife, the flex cut pelican knife. But I want to show you a couple of ways to do it. We want this cut to be about half an inch crossed here. So you want to be about a nice C cut like this. We want to take out a third, leave a third, and take out a third on the other side. Whatever we do on one side, we do on the other side. It's going to be symmetrical. With the scorp, you can come through here with your line, just to demonstrate, to get it started. You can come through here just to know where your line is. But you don't have to do that. You can just come in here and start with a C cut. And get a third out. I'm not going to do this whole blank because this will wait for me. I can do it in stages. So what I'll do on this side, I'll do the same on that side. So what I'm doing now more than, than I was, I'm using a gouge. And these are stew-by gouges. This ha they're all number 11s. Everything you see here is a number 11. I have three different sweeps. This happens to be the 18. This is a 16. And this is a tw 12, I guess. I think it's a 12. So I use this bench hook with my little piece of scrap wood here so I don't tear my, my, my bench hook. And I just lean my body into it, and I'm just going to push. You can see what I'm doing right down the center of that, of that line. I'm just going to push that out. And I can just, whatever table height works for you, I'm sure you're used to working with gouges, you can just put your body weight into it. When you're working with a gouge, you don't use your arms and your shoulders as much as you use your body, your body strength to just push into it. Of course, it's going to be a fixed. Once I get half of that, or a third of that out, then I'm going to measure down here for my hinge. And this is going to be about two and a half inches here on the wing side, about two and a quarter here on the tail side. And all I'm doing is making a slight angle across here. This doesn't have to, the only thing I'm doing is pointing out that there's, these are the wings, they're going to be a little bit longer the tail is going to be a little bit shorter. I'm just giving the bird a little bit of style. But this line could be right straight across. We're doing the hinge. And we're going to have a little buffer zone here. And When I say a buffer zone, we just don't want to get this, this cut into this cut. We want to keep these two cuts completely independent of each other. And now, with this in mind, I go back to my scorp, I come across here, and I put the scorp line all the way across. The scorp, line, the scorp really is adv advantageous at this point to get that all the way across, because that's going to serve as more of a stop cut. Again, this is a hinge that we're making, and so we want it to taper down plus have an angle. So we're making a V-cut with a long side and a little short side. And we're going to do the same on the other side. We can start our cut like this and come down. And actually, I usually do it this way. It's a better, I'm, I try to work away from myself, and it's more comfortable for me to do that. You probably could, but remember, you're working with with wet wood and it's really stringy. Yeah. 
But what we, that's what, one of the reasons why we've gone to the gouge more is because this is a two and a half 25 millimeter stubi. And a lot of people don't know that, that uh, tool makers make a two and a half, but they do. And so it's not a special order from stubi, you just have to ask for it. And so it's a sweet little tool. It's not a straight. It's just got enough of a sweep. So again, with me laying this down here now, I can just go up that, from that buffer zone, pick up that, I'm going to cut out my, my pencil line, and just lean into it like that and go down to my stop cut. I'm trying to hold the table as I'm doing it so it's not going to move away from me. Typically, I'd be working with both hands, but it, this is OK. So what I'm ending up with is a taper. See, I'm coming down. I don't know if you can see this. I'll put a little more on this side so there's better definition. Because I really want to explain this. In fan carving, there's three things that we do. We have a, a, an interlock. That's where we're going to interlock the feathers. We have a hinge where we're going to pivot the feathers. And we've got to rive the wood. We've got to split the fibers. And every fan carver has to do those three basic things. All the styles can be different. You can see how I've come in here. This is about you know a half inch across. And I brought it in about center, almost to center. On my, this is going to serve as a stop cut in the vise. This one is ready to rive. I've already got the interlock in there, and I've got the hinge in there. And so we're going to rive this. So this will serve as the stop cut. But you can't have, when we think of stop cuts, we think of stop cuts as being right straight in. We need to have this little bit of a taper right here, just a slight little taper. We want to feel it as a stop cut. We want to know when we get down there, because we don't want to get into this part of the wood. But we have to have that little bit of a taper as a chamfer or a draft. If you were a tool maker, you'd have a draft to get your molding out. It's that kind of a thing that we need to have right here. So you want to have a nice, crisp line but just a little bit of a taper with a long taper here. OK. So now we've got our interlock cut. We've got our hinge cut. And now we're going to rive the wood here. And at that point, you're going to take your thumb guard and your, um, your glove off. And by the way, when you're working with gouges, you don't need this either. It's only when you're working with tools, especially the pelican knife, because that sweeping curve there can come back and get your thumb. So I'm going to move over here to the vise. <coughs> you want the vise, your piece of wood is going to be in here so that it's, as you're standing over it, it's going to be straight down. And you're going to start at the the wing side of the bird and work back to the tail. And there's a couple reasons that we do it that way. For one, for one thing, the bird is going to be, I'll draw it on here. The bird is in here like this. This is the wing side. So the bird's going to be something like this. This is the wing side. This is the tail side. So we start in here like this, the wing side working back to the tail side, because these are sacrificial feathers right here. We want the bird to have a nicely shaped head, so we're going to cut these off. It gives us an opportunity to feel how this piece of wood is reacting to the knife. It gives us an opportunity to um, find a good rive line and then try to stick with it. So. At this point, we need to find a good rive line. So I take the draw knife. 
we, we, we work with the back of the draw knife facing us. The bevel edge is out there. Now I can't see this cut, I have to feel it. Because if I'm going to start where I can see it, it's going to be right here. And that's way too thick. See, I'm looking, because the cut is going to, it's actually not a cut, it's a split. The blade is sharp at the back of that bevel. So I have to tip the knife back, and I use my thumbs to steady the knife. I tip it back to see how thin I want it. I stand it up, and then I just push down. And I'm finding a rive line. Now, the main thing I'm doing is keeping this flat back snug to this piece of wood that I'm slicing. If I started like this and I was too far this way, I'd be cutting back. And now I'm cutting through the fibers. If you've ever done a piece of kindling or split wood for kindling, I'm sure some of you in this room have done that. You put your hatchet in and you see that rive line go. It, and this would be doing the same thing if the wood were dry, but it's got enough moisture in it that the rive line isn't happening. I'm letting it go with the knife. If there's a little wave in the wood, I let the knife go with the wave. So it's just like making curls with a planer, except I'm doing it um, vertically. I don't have a planer going like this. I'm making a curl, just a little thin piece of wood. And it's better to go thin, even if you lose some, than to go too thick. Because when you're going thin, you can feel what's happening. Like I say, you've got a good probably quarter inch to half an inch here that's all going to come off anyway. So run your test, see how it feels. If you get too thin, it's not fun to work with. Then you've got to pull them apart with a, you know, they're, they're just too fragile and so this is a good rive line, it feels like. And you just keep on going. One thing about riving, too, if your wood is a little bit more fibrous, then every piece of wood is different. Even from one side of the tree, it's different from another side of a tree. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. People say, well, can you use basswood? In our first book, we said, yes, we can use basswood. In our second book, we didn't recommend it because we had too many trial and errors Basswood can be a tricky wood. It can have soft spots, you know. So even though it comes from Minnesota, I'm not going to recommend it for fan birds. Um, sometimes, if, as I started to say, if the wood is a little more fibrous, you can start here, like on this side, and slice across all the way over to the other side. As long, you know, you can use that whole dimension on your sharp edge. Um, but the main thing is to leave that flat back snug against here, to the point that you're almost pulling these two handles back towards you. Now, it'll take me about seven minutes to do this whole thing, so you get the idea. Another thing I wanted to point out is that the, um, we, do, we work with more rounded top here for the tip of the feathers because I've got a better view. With this knife laying here like this, I can see from here to here where I'm at. If I work with a pointed, say if I was working with something like this and I wanted to get that point on there, then my bird is in here like this and I've got this dinky little point to try to see how thin I am. It just doesn't work very well. So if you want to come up with a pattern like that, there's nothing wrong with that. But I would almost advise you to do it a little more like this. And then when you're done riving, you can still take your knife in here and thin it up on both sides and bring it to a point. I think it would be advantageous to do that. Once we get these all arrived, we're going to draw the bird body on like this. The head will be here, as I said. Whittle this out so that you've got, um, you know, a nicely shaped head. This bird is the Holy Spirit bird, so we want it to look nice. 
I cut a couple of these little tail feathers off just to give them a little bit of a belly here. And then I'm ready to interlock. I give it a good flex. See that flexing there? Oh, I should mention too, once I get these all arrived, I'm going to go back into the interlock and narrow this down more. I didn't do it sooner because I needed structural in, uh, integrity for slicing. And the same with the hinge. I'm going to narrow the hinge down. Oh, the, the interlock will be about that narrow by the time I'm done. And the way that I do that with a gouge, I started out with the number 11, 18 millimeter. I'll either use a 16 to come back, or the 18 plus um, the 16 millimeter. But more often, I'll use the smaller one. It, these are all three number 11s, as I said. And I'll just come back in through here, and I'll just seat that right through that center and make that thinner. And so I don't have a line here. I'll rock this this way, and then I'll rock it that way so that I'm making a center cut, getting it thinner, and then I'll take my line out if it, if it leaves a line. Then I'll do the same thing with the hinge. I want this to be about the size of a, a thick toothpick. And then I flex it real good. You can see the movement there. And then I'll put it in, this is called the third hand. We got this idea from Finland. And you can use it for painting or whatever. And because I'm not going to finish this, I usually just sit down and make yourself comfortable and just hold this between my knees like this. And then I just interlock back and forth. But since we have the vise sitting here, I'll just use that. OK. Um, is this a good place for me to start? Can you see what I'm doing here, or can you, you can watch? OK. The first feather comes to one side, the second feather to the opposite side. The third feather comes over here and interlocks. The fourth feather will come back over here and interlock. And just go back and forth like this. Now you're going to hear them snap and crackle. And it's OK. They're not going to come off. And if they do, it's no problem. It's better to go thin and lose some than to be too thick. Because if you lost them when they're too thick, which you're liable to do, because they don't have good performance then, um, then you're going to have a gap. But you could lose three or four feathers in a row here, and you wouldn't see them. Because as I'm interlocking them, the next little feather is just swinging right up and covering that. If I would have lost one or so in here, the next one would have just covered up that little gap. So I cheat a little bit. I just do them in groups, and then I just snug them in. And I'm always pulling. That hinge has a purpose. You want to make it work for you. A lot of the European birds are like this. They're flat, and they hang from the ceiling, and um, they, uh, um, the wind catches them. They're in perpetual motion. Uh, I like to see a bird that looks like he's rising. That, that one is so thin, I don't like it. So I'm going to take it out. It's easy to get two. When I get down about this far, I'm going to go ahead with the tail now. I'll start with the last one, the last feather, and that's going to be my center feather. The next one comes to one side and interlocks. The next feather comes to the opposite side and interlocks. Next one will come back over here and interlock. Now what I'm doing is building up a tail. Sometimes it starts to bind up a little bit. It's because the bottom part of the feather has to go over 
this one, but yet underlock under that one. So if it starts to bind up on you, you can check that out. So you want to try to tip it. I just go until I think I have the look that I might like. I'm going to stop right there because I'm not sure. That looks like a pretty small tail. But I've got the advantage of making the decision of where these feathers go. If, the, if, if I want more on the tail, I can take them from the wings. And if I want more on the wings, I can take them out of the tail. So we can make that decision when we get there. We want the bird just to have a nice, pleasing look, whatever you're, you know, whatever is pleasing to you. It's an individual choice. Now, there's three feathers. So we're going to take one of them out. We just have to decide which one because we have an odd number. So I'm going to take this out and see. I'll kind of position it up alongside the head like that. I think I'll put these two in the tail. And then I'll take this one out. I'll put it in the tail first <coughs> because if one of these breaks, or gets damaged somehow, or is a little, I think I'll just go ahead and pull that one out because it was a little thin. Now I've got a tail that looks like that, and I just kind of bring it up a little bit. I can't reef on it too much because I don't want this one to break out on me. And I just kind of position it so that it's, everything is centered. I have some 22 gauge wire, and I make my own little hooks. And uh, the reason I make my own hooks is because I want to have a shank long enough to sit down in there. Some people use fish hooks. I have a little quarter inch um, needle nose plier because I want a tight little circle here. I use, I use black thread because it tends to go away in space. White thread or fish line tends to show up. Get my little knot tied. Then with my pliers, I'm going to stick this right back in here, right about there. What that's going to do is conceal the wire and the string. And it's also going to help secure those first two feathers of the wings. And there you've got a bird. So the three basic cuts, the interlock cut, the hinge cut, and the riving. Any questions? This is considered an entry level to wood carving. Yes? Is there a point where the cedar is too old to soak? You know, we tried to reconstitute wood that had been laying for some time, and we didn't enjoy working with it. But I do know, and I can't tell you the age of the wood, the log that was down, but I do know um, that there are carvers that take old fence posts and work them up into fan carving. But one person that I know that does that, um, He'll put it in a plastic bag, add moisture in there, a black plastic bag, let it lay outside, go out and make a slice. 
and then maybe a week later come back and make another slice. Well, I couldn't work that way. I've got to do, you know, more production style. So um, we say that you can reconstitute the white cedar, and um, it's a very forgiving wood. I mean, of course, depending on the time of the year that you get it, um, how much sap wood is how much sap is up in the wood and stuff, it can lay for several weeks. Of course, the sooner you get to it, the better you are. That's always the way, especially if it's damaged. Like if you got somewhere a logger had uh, a logging equipment had grabbed it with the claws and left marks in the bark and stuff, you know, then that's that's kind of damaged. And then the spalting gets in it and stuff, and uh, it starts to mold. So. The profile that you carve in your block of wood will determine that. So you have to decide that, like this, this is very small. Um, but once they're interlocked, you're, you just let it dry. Now, we, um, like this bird, when we did this in our book, our second book, um, we did a hummingbird with two wings and a tail. And then we took it all apart before it dried. I mean, within the same five minutes. <laughs> and we interlocked it this way, and the, and the way that we, and, and it's the same bird in the book. But what we did with this, then to do a single-tailed bird, you start with this last feather, just like we did with the tail on this bird. And we went back and forth, back, and we just kept right on going. And one of the things that you can do that's, that's kind of interesting to make detail on here is like with this, uh, with this bird, we've got a little detail in here. That's just done with a scorp. Before, I mean, when this bird is still in this position, before the riving, I mean, all the riving is completed. Then we come through where the buffer line is. We come through here with a scorp on both sides on the buffer line. Then when you fan it out, you have this sweet little detail, which single-tailed birds, it lends itself nicely to that, whereas a bird with two wings and a tail tends to look a little messy when you've got detail on there. This is a fan that has uh, three scorp marks on it and then fanned out. And you can see the detail in it. So, I mean, it, it, it uh, looks very elegant with it, but it's not like you've made this chips. It's not like chip carving where you took those chips out. You just do it in one big swoop and then it's there. Yeah, the hummingbird, the goose, and the dove, it's all, all the same profiles. The interlock is one inch down, the hinge is like two and a half, two and a quarter, and then the only difference that we do here is for a hummingbird, you'd, or a, you could, yeah, this would be a dove blank. A hummingbird, you'd want a little bit longer one for the beak, and a goose, you'd want a little bit longer one for the goose. But it's all the same profile here. Okay.